So welcome to um, the PharmEd podcast. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by Tony Yarrow, who heads up what is affectionately known at PharmEd as the B team, um, uh, and is our is our it looks after the eight period here at PharmEd um, and has done for a couple of years now. Um, so could you start by telling us, Tony, a bit about what the eight period, what goes on at PharmEd in terms of beekeeping for people who don't know? Um, yeah, well, bee, bees do the same, you know, wherever they are all over the world, and that is um, pollinate flowers and collect pollen and nectar. Um, and it's the same here, but here is an unusually good spot because um, there are, to our knowledge, over 30 different species of flowering plant that produce honey um, all around the year. So right from the you know, very earliest snowdrops and crocuses all the way through to the ivy, you know, and you've got the same foin and the chicory in the fields mm. and all the things in the hedges and you've got the orchard. So it's a very good spot because you know, there's shelter, they've got water from the ponds, you know, in the um, natural flood mm. um, prevention. And, you know, it's just a perfect site. And they've got the shelter behind them from the hedge. Um, so, yeah, we're just looking after, we're just looking after the bees and trying to make sure that they're healthy and strong and, you know, happy. So, and happy so it's, a small, it's quite bees. a small apiary, isn't it? We've got, what, how many... How many hives? Do you have? <clears throat> well, at the moment there are just two. Um, we had we we lost colonies the wasps in the summer, mm. which I've never seen before. I've never seen as many wasps as that. Um, there's a there's a limit in any apiary to the amount of hives you can keep in one place because there's only a certain amount of nectar. Um, and also there's the natural bees too, not so far away. But I think. We could easily keep up to six or eight colonies here mm. um, without them competing with each other. Um, and I hope that we'll be, there were four in the summer and I'm hoping that we'll build it up to, you know, four or six. Right, okay. Hopefully next year. And how does that work? How do, when you say build it up, do you, I'm always quite curious about how you do, you, do you buy the bees? Do you sort of encourage them or do you? Well, you could, but um, what you do is every year, um, bees like to swarm mm. and they like to swarm because um, bee colonies die and the way that the colony reproduces is by swarming which means it breaks in half and um, if you don't manage that then the swarm goes off and that's bad from two points of view one is that you've just lost half your bees mm. and the other is that um, it might fetch up in somebody else's roof um, or somewhere else antisocial mm. and you know that's a problem for the person who suddenly got a load of bees in their roof that they didn't want so I think from a social point of view it's responsible to to manage swarming and um, also you know we don't want to just lose 10 15 20 thousand bees mm. um, so when you see they're making preparations to swarm which means they're making queen cells which are a different shape than any other cell in the colony then you just simply split it in half and um, that's how you reproduce colonies so basically they do it themselves mm. and we're just working with nature that's brilliant yeah mm. and and the bees make um, honey here which you then harvest and we sell sometimes in the farm ed cafe don't we when, we, when it's well, been always yeah always yeah yeah, yeah. Um, Yes, and I should say that we don't harvest their honey. I mean, there is this idea that beekeepers sort of take all the honey away and feed them sugar. Mm. And certainly in our case, we don't do that. So we have a, the bottom box in the hive, which is the one that they live in through the year, is called a brood chamber. And we use large brood chambers, which are capable of storing an awful lot of honey more than enough to see the bees through the winter and on top of those you you put supers which just comes from the latin word super means above so come the springtime when the brood box is full you put a box on top and sometimes you might put quite a lot of boxes if it's a very good season um, and we extract the honey from the supers if there is any 
and we leave everything below to the bees. So it's like we're only taking surplus honey when there is surplus honey. Mm. And if there isn't surplus honey, I mean, I see it as a partnership between us and them. You know, if they have a really good year, they've got enough for themselves through the winter and we've got the surplus. Um, if it's a really bad year, they might not have enough for themselves and we'll make sure that they have enough to get through the winter mm. and we won't get any. So again, it's, it's working, kind of working with them. That's the yeah. idea. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So can you, if we just rewind a little bit, can you tell, um, tell us how, you, how and why you got into, into beekeeping? Um, <coughs> well, yeah, I was, I was living on a commune in a place called Lanarth in Wales in 1975, and um, one afternoon I was looking for, I was looking for something in a, in a one of the barns, and I came across an old beehive, and in this beehive were the frames with the with the combs, the honeycombs, and I just saw the wax, the you know the way they make the cells in the honeycombs. And I was just thought, this is amazing, it's extraordinary. I mean, they make the, the cells are hexagonal, so that's a pattern that can just repeat itself. And, <clears throat> you know, they've got cells on one side, cells on the other side, a sort of sheet of wax in the middle. It's beautiful, you know, it's simple and it's amazing and it's strong. And it isn't even that, I mean, that's amazing, but there's even more amazing. You've got the worker cells and the drone cells. Now, drones are bigger than workers, they're the males. So <clears throat> the drone cells are bigger than the worker cells, and they have to, but they're still hexagonal, and they have to fit them together. And the way they do that is just amazing. You know, it's extraordinary. How do they know? How do these little creatures that have only been born like three or four weeks ago, how do they know? to make these hexagonal cells in two different sizes. So immediately you're thinking, goodness gracious me, you know, this is like you've suddenly arrived in Narnia or something. Okay. There's this, um, this world that you knew nothing about. And, you know, within about a week, I was like, I want to be a, I want to be a beekeeper. No, I want to be a commercial beekeeper. You know, I want to spend my life with these amazing little insects, you know, and I was reading lots of books about <coughs> it and this was, nearly 50 years ago. Mm. So you've been keeping bees for 50 years? I had a break in the middle because I was very, we have four children and I had a business which I started in 92 and um, it just got, I just got too busy. Mm. So I had a bit of a, I had a few years off but I think I always knew that I would come back to it and mm. I came back to it about 15 years ago. Mm. So how, I mean how, E how sort of time consuming and how easy is it to get into and if someone who's listening to this and thinks I'd like to start keeping bees um, is it something obviously something you, you find very rewarding and that you you love but how, how difficult is it to get going and make it work um, yeah there's several questions there. I mean it it can take as much time or as little time as you want to you know, and the real sort of enthusiasts would like to spend all their time doing beekeeping. But in the winter, you know, they're in the hive, they're clustering. Um, there's nothing you can do to help. And there isn't really anything much needs to be done between now and March. You can mend things, you can make apiary stands, you mm. can do all sorts of things, but the bees are all right for about six months of the year from, let's say, the end of September through to sometime in March. So that's quite good because the season is very intense, mm. but there's a quite a long off season. And so what is, what is the season? What is, well, the season, season depending on the, you know, the weather, some there are early seasons, late seasons, but on the whole, um, by the middle of April, your decent colonies will be ready to store surplus honey. Mm. So you need to start thinking about putting supers on. Um, and not long after that, they will start thinking about swarming. And that swarming season has come forwards in the time I've been beekeeping. Normally, in the good old days, quote unquote, um, you wouldn't see signs of swarming till the middle of May, but now it's, it can be as early as the 20th of April, say. So, that's, so you've got to be a bit vigilant, really, mm. from then on. And then <coughs> the season, you know, you 
take the second lot of honey off in August, you check Varroa, you check if they've got enough stores, you know, it's all done by the end of September at the latest. Now to the question about is it easy to get into, no it isn't, it's, um, it isn't because there's quite a lot of equipment that you need and there's quite a lot that can go wrong and I think some people just fall in love with bees the way that I did and they're happy to, you know, whatever problems there are, they will overcome those problems one way or another. But um, it goes in phases because <clears throat> in the 70s when I started beekeeping, we were in the middle of the self-sufficiency you know, craze. Remember John Seymour and, mm. um, you know, when, when I was a hippie in Wales, you know, we all had John Seymour, self-sufficiency and Lawrence D. Hills, grow your own fruit and vegetables and everybody tried to keep bees and there were a lot of failures. I mean, there were, you know, some people who are, um, there was a friend of mine called Dave Wainwright who is now, you know, well-known bee, commercial beekeeper in Wales and he does this fair trade thing with Africa. Um, and then there are people who just didn't make it and now we've had another boom at the moment and I think some people will end up keeping bees for the rest of their lives and probably maybe some of the others will find it's harder work than mm. they thought and mm. won't continue with it. I think also the other thing, when I first started beekeeping there wasn't the Varroa and we've got a couple of other things, well several things actually. What's the Varroa? Um, I'll come on to that yeah, in okay. a sec. There's <laughs> going to be the Asian Hornet which right. is now in this country, mm. which eats bees, hovers right. outside oh, the hive wow. and eats bees. Um, there's a thing called the small hive beetle and there's another parasite called tropi lilaps, which again, it, the small hive beetle and tro tropi lilaps aren't in this country yet as far as we know. Um, the Asian hornet, the number of sightings have increased exponentially this year um, and there was a sighting in North Oxfordshire, North Oxford a few weeks, well, uh, September. Um, so there are these extra challenges apart from, you mm. know, the seasonal one yeah, and the swarm one ones. and the, mm. disease, the diseases that were here already. Um, so I think it's not for everybody, but, mm. you know, if you care that much, you'll cope with the mm. stuff that life throws at you. Mm. Um, Varroa is a parasite of honeybees and it's a very pernicious one. Um, was first discovered in Java in two, 1903 and it's gradually spread around the world with globalisation and it was introduced into this country accidentally about 30 years ago um, <clears throat> and a varroa, if you were a bee, the varroa is about the size of your fist um, and they get, they ride around on the honeybee sucking their blood um, and they get into the brood cells and then they the female mite parasitizes the larva and then has her babies yes, which also feed off the larva and when it becomes a pupa and then the the bee is born deformed sometimes it'll only have one wing or right. not the right number of legs or it's just weak and then they become subject to other diseases mm. so varroa needs to be coped with and we're still learning how to do it mm. Um, mm, yes, you know, fair, in, yeah. in, in Asian countries where they've had varroa for hundreds if not thousands of years, the bees have learnt to cope with it oh, and they wow. groom the varroa off each other and Goodness. they manage that the mite and the host live together. But with globalisation you get this thing introduced that the bees have no experience what of. to do. Yeah. And then, <coughs> um, <coughs> you know, they're... they're mm hopelessly vulnerable mm. because they've just not learned yeah. how to cope yeah so, so what do you what do you find so I mean just just hearing you talk about even that bees are obviously such fascinating creatures aren't they what what do you find particularly fascinating about them well they're millions of years old for a start mm -hmm. um, they've got an extraordinary social organization <coughs> they can tell each other where okay. flowers are two or three miles away how to go and get them. Um, you know, there's the whole <coughs> swarming thing. Um, they're just extraordinary. And I think that it's one of those subjects where every, every season is completely different from the last one. 
and you're always learning. I mean, it's one of those subjects where the more you know, the more you realise that you don't know. And mm -hmm. I'm not just saying that. Um, here's an interesting thing. Um, in the Chippy News this month was a photo by another beekeeper in Chippy Norton called Paul Endon, who I know quite well. Um, and it was of a colony that had made its combs just in the open. And there were these combs in the open. And that was strange because, and he said he'd never seen it before. Well, in this, in this apiary down here, we had a colony that made it, that, a swarm that made a nest underneath one of the beehives. I remember. So there were bees in the hive and there were bees Under underneath the hive. The hive. <laughs> so <clears throat> Paul, who's been keeping bees for 20 something years, um, had never seen it before. And I'd never seen it before either. Mm. But in the same year, suddenly these swarms own, started making their nests outside. Their now what happened to ours was, I think at a certain point in August, they just decided, you know, this is too much hard work being outside. Mm -hmm. And they all went back into the hive that was upstairs. They sort of begged their way in, um, leaving the combs empty. They're just gone. So That's I'd just... never seen that before. Um, this year I saw bees foraging on blackberries, not on the flowers, which they do, but mm. on the actual fruit. Oh, wow. And in our garden there were bees foraging on the um, figs, which I'd never seen before. So there were another two things I'd never seen before this year. Um, things change very quickly, you know, you, you, you know you, the, well a couple of years ago we had a really, really wet May <clears throat> and the bees just couldn't get out. Suddenly it, the, the rain stopped the temperature warmed up and within 10 days they got masses of honey. Mm -hmm. You know, so you went from Nothing. sort of famine to feast mm. almost overnight and you have to be ready for that. Mm. Um, I just don't, don't know anything like it. I'm yeah. hooked. Yeah, you know, I can I'm tell. Hooked. Yeah, I'm hooked. <laughs> yeah, same. I'm sure everyone will be listening to, reading, listening to this as well because it's just, they're just, um, just fascinating. For people who wanted to get, who have sort of, you know, listened to this or maybe reading about bees and want to, mm. want to get started, I mean, you have, how much? I mean, how much garden do you have to have? Or how much land do you have to have? Um, they seem to take it quite a well, small I've, area. Well, I've never kept bees in my garden. I've never dared to. Um, one reason is because because of this risk that you'll lose mm. a swarm. Yeah. Um, and a friend of mine in York had somebody next door who kept bees very badly, and swarms went into this guy's garden and all over the place. So that's one yeah. thing. Um, your kids getting stung is another yeah. potential. And if if your kids get stung by a wasp you know the neighbours might just think it was one of your bees mm. they might not know the difference mm. and also they go to the toilet on the wing and um, <laughs> when I was at Taylor's of Wellin years ago um, we had a couple of hives at the top of the car park and people used to come to the factory and buy their bee equipment and when they got back they'd find these little brown spots on the wing, windscreen <laughs> and once they've dried you know they're really hard to get off, Are they? <laughs> and they tend to, for some reason, they tend to go for people's sheets, you know, on the washing line. Right. So that's another reason why I don't keep bees in the garden. Um, <clears throat> but the best thing I think is, in London, people keep bees on their roofs. Um, the corner of a field is very good because mm. it's out of the way. Um, you get shelter from the hedge. Mm. There's probably water around, but you need to check. Um, you'd need a very big garden. To keep bees successfully, yeah. yeah. Mm. So you're looking at, you're looking at um, ants, really. In, well, a, in the country, I've never, <coughs> excuse me, I've never kept bees in in rural areas, and certainly not in a, a city. But I think in the country, somewhere tucked away in the corner of a field mm. is great. Um, yeah. There is a risk of theft of beehives, which, luckily, I've never succumbed to. Um, but generally speaking, people don't like, a lot of people don't like insects mm. and they don't just like seeing insects flying around and I think that sort of tucked away is quite a good place to have mm. them. Mm. Excellent. Yeah. And people can come and, so obviously when you were saying about our, the honey, I mean, it does, the honey does taste amazing, doesn't it, the, the, the farmer yes. has the, um, your honey. Um, it's so describe the, describe the flavour of... Um, Honeydale honey, appropriately. Well, there are named, no two. It? There are no two. Um, it tastes different every no year. Two honeys. It? Mm. The spring honey is different to the summer honey, mm. and this year's honey is different to last year's. Because it's flavoured by what the pollinating. Honey. Well, the, the okay. Flowers. So you've got 
Um, here, the same foin in the fields. Mm. Um, you've got the chicory in the fields. Then you've got all the weeds. You've got knapweed, you've got sweet clover, lots of blackberry in the hedges and so mm. forth. And every year, different, flower, different flowers give honey some years, not other years. Mm. So the white clover gives you honey when it's dry and hot. Um, some years you get masses of honey from clover and it's lovely, it's very pale mm. and sweet. Um, other years it doesn't, the conditions aren't right and it doesn't give you anything. Uh, the blackberry is quite, is probably the most consistent yielder, um, but you never get the same mix twice mm. because all of them produce more under certain conditions and other conditions. Mm. Um, sweet clover seems to be incredibly prolific some years. Um, also known as yellow melilot. Some years it's really prolific, others, others mm. it isn't. So you just, you know, you're, <clears throat> if you did a pollen analysis, you mm. can tell um, how much of what is in what, but it'll never be the same twice. Mm. Um, but I think the general thing is that it's, it's a mixed floral honey. Mm. And, um, so if you're going to come and taste yes. it. But this year, um, this year's honey, the summer honey, which there wasn't much of because the weather was so bad, but there's quite a lot of honeydew in it. Mm. It's a very dark colour and it tastes like nothing else I've never ever. Oh, really? That's another first this year. Yeah. It's, it's honeydew. Wow. There's a mm. lot of honeydew in it, which comes from lime trees. Um, Goodness. Yes. Mm. And so people can come and pick up a jar? Well, from... it's not. I, don't imagine it's everybody's favourite because it's quite a strong flavour. Right. You either like it or you don't. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. But it is very dark. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tony. It's been fascinating talking to you. And we do run sort of, um, you, you've come and spoken here, haven't you, at lunchtime? Yeah, well, I'm actually doing a course next year, a two-day course, <coughs> which, is co which is going to be called um, Honeybees and Their World. And the reason why I call that is because it's a course for people who are interested in honeybees rather than people who are beekeepers or want to be mm. beekeepers. So what we're going to try and do is to cover, you know, the context of honeybees and other pollinators, um, you know, how pollination happens, how honey is made, what's the difference between runny and set honey, all those, all those sorts of things. And there'll be a little bit, depending on who comes, I suppose, but there'll be a little bit about beekeeping but it's not going to be a course a about beekeeping course. It's, it's a general course about about honey about bees and be honey bees and honey mm. yeah fantastic thank you so much we'll look forward to that and uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you thank you well likewise thank you thank you